Mike Gallagher watched from his second-floor bedroom window as his wife passionately embraced Jake Williams, the man who always said he was his best friend, outside their home. He brought her home from the city center, where they spent several hours together. This meeting was their fifth date, and as Mike watched and listened to what they were talking about, he learned of their plan to further humiliate him. His so-called friend told Christy in no uncertain terms that he wanted to spend a whole week with her, but she, after thinking a little, shook her head with regret. Not for a week, Jake, not yet, she said. Maybe a weekend, but only on one condition. What is the condition? he asked. You have to make Mike pay for our date, she blurted out, inspired by her idea. He laughed. It sounds stupid, he said. You know that I am much richer than him. I will easily pay any expenses. No, no, she interrupted. You don't understand the most important part of this idea. And what is the point? Jake arched an eyebrow, looking at her questioningly. Humiliation for Mike, she said. Come on, honey. Admit that you like to humiliate him, don't you? Taunt him, making him feel like a piece of crap every time. Well, Jake drawled. You know, he's actually my best friend and I... Bullshit, the lover snapped, rolling her eyes. What I know is that you like to fool him and humiliate him almost as much as I do. And it turns me on so much every time. She was so excited that she almost jumped on the spot. Listen, Christy, let's better put an end to this long-running farce, he pleaded. Come with me and just leave this sucker to his fate. I want to marry you and spend the rest of my life with you. She laughed. I'll tell you what, stud, she finally said. Let me make him pay the full bill for our hot weekend of wild sex, and I'll think about your offer, okay? Jake sighed a little annoyed, but then grinned. Oh, I'm sure this weekend will definitely be very naughty, he whispered in her ear, hugging her and preparing to return to his car. I'll talk to you soon, but don't make me wait too long, about... She watched Jake leave and even waved after him as he drove away, then turned to the home she shared with her husband, Mike. Upon entering, she immediately began to undress as she walked up the stairs. When Christy entered the bedroom, she made eye contact with Mike, who was sitting on the bed. Throwing her blouse onto the floor, she grinned and looked straight at him as she unbuttoned her skirt, letting it fall to her feet. Now she was completely naked, because this married woman always went on dates with Jake without wearing underwear. Christy went into the bathroom and began to examine herself in the mirror, leaving the door open. You probably heard what we were talking about, she asked casually, watching his reaction through the mirror out of the corner of her eye. I'm leaving you for Jake. We're going to have a dirty weekend together, and you're going to pay all our expenses. Soon I will leave you for good to marry him. I've been paying for everything since I married you three years ago, Mike said sadly. I thought we were fine. I did nothing but love you with all my heart and tried to show it every day. Don't you love me at all? Christy just snorted contemptuously. How could I even continue to love you? She asked sarcastically. To me, you are nothing more than a slobber and a doormat who allows his best friend to date his own wife. Taking a moment to look away from the mirror, she saw Mike turning to the window and dropping his shoulders sniffling on the bed. Oh, come on, be a man, she chuckled disdainfully in his direction. So that's why you've been so disrespectful to me these last few months? What about your vows at the altar? He asked quietly. Do you really think that the words that I once foolishly said will stop me? Her voice was full of irony. The loser and weakling I see in this room doesn't deserve me. Please, Christy, please don't do this to me. I still love you and your cruel words break my heart. Mike's voice trembled as he glanced over her luxurious figure. Even years later, he continued to look at her with loving eyes, just like on that wedding day when, incredibly happy, he held her hands and put the ring on her finger. Christy noticed that he was looking at her naked body with lust in his eyes. Snorting, she shook her head. Don't even think about it, slug, she said. I will never let you touch me again. When I want, 
I'll call a real man to come and satisfy me properly. What about you? Well, hubby, she grinned sarcastically. So be it. I'll let you sit in the chair in the corner and watch me have fun in front of your eyes. Carried away by her fantasies, Christy did not notice how, with every minute, the features of his always soft face turned to stone. The skin on his cheekbones became rigidly stretched, and his fingers involuntarily clenched into fists. Damn you, bitch, Mike muttered dully, getting out of bed. Christy's hand, combing her curls, froze midway. For the first time, her gentle and loving husband uttered such rude words to her. Straightening up and turning her head, she watched with her eyes as he left the room and began to go down the stairs. Intrigued and partly a little alarmed, Christy threw the hairbrush into the sink, hurried downstairs after Mike, and saw him reach his hand towards the front door. Where are you going? Will you go to the pub? Get drunk and complain to the bartender about your worthless life? Or maybe you'll run to mommy and cry on her shoulder like a child? She chuckled sarcastically, standing on the steps of the stairs and placing her hands on her hips. Stopping for a moment at the door, he silently looked at her for several long seconds with sadness in his eyes. Upstairs, in their former family bedroom, he realized that he had taken all he could from her and decided that he no longer owed this woman anything. Goodbye, Christy, he finally said before slamming the door. She heard his car door open and then slam shut. The engine roared, and a few seconds later she saw him drive away. Where is he going? Christy wondered in bewilderment, but then just shrugged. And God be with him, she thought carefree. Good riddance to horn trash. She grabbed her phone and dialed a familiar number. Hello, love, she cooed. My slug has crawled out of the house somewhere, so why don't you come and have sex with me? Are you leaving already? Hurry up, I can't stand it. Three days later, Michael drove up to the house. Opening the garage door with a signal from inside his car, he drove inside and closed the large door. Grabbing his briefcase, he purposely walked into the house. Christy was sitting at the kitchen table at this hour of the morning, reading the newspaper and drinking coffee. Michael didn't say a word to her, simply walking past his wife, who raised her head, and proceeded to his home office. Captivated by curiosity, Christy hastily stood up from the table, walked to the door of his office and tried to enter. She turned the knob, but the door was locked. Strange, she thought. My husband never locked this door. She knocked on the heavy wooden upholstery and... When the lock clicked a few seconds later, she turned the knob. Opening the door, she saw him sitting at his desk. He carefully looked at a map of some area on his computer. Christy knew that Mike was in the process of designing a housing development around one of the many lakes in the area and decided that the map showed exactly what he was working on. What do you want? He asked abruptly, looking up at her with a heavy gaze. For a moment, she recoiled and felt unsure. He had never been harsh with her before, but on the other hand, she realized that she had been acting rather disrespectfully towards him lately. I, ahem, uh, I was worried, she answered, managing to clear her throat of the sudden hoarseness. You left three days ago and I haven't heard anything about you. I tried to call you on your mobile, but you never answered. Are you sure you really cared about me? He asked Ed the question with obvious sarcasm. Christy paused for a moment. Was it really her, Mikey? He looked like Mike, sounded like Mike, but there was something a little different about him, like he had changed inside. Perhaps she had gone too far with him. She tried to reach out to stroke his cheek, but he managed to evade her touch. Don't you want to kiss your wife? She asked offendedly. It's been three whole days since I last saw you. He studied her for several moments, as if she were some kind of disgusting insect that had to be examined under a microscope. Then he shook his head negatively. No, he said, returning to his computer. Please close the door when you leave. Now, Christy was truly confused. Her husband never refused her attention and always kissed her at every opportunity. This same man, sitting imperturbable in front of her, was so cold. She backed away, 
carefully closed the door to his office and immediately headed to the master bedroom to get her phone. She dialed a familiar number, and the man answered after the first ring. Jake, he's back, Christy said. But, I don't know. Something is wrong. It was as if he had become a completely different person. He didn't even kiss me when he entered the house. Don't worry so much about it, honey, Jake hummed into the phone soothingly. He probably just realized that you're leaving him and there's nothing he can do to stop you. I'll arrive in the evening and the two of us will take care of everything. Just let me talk to him for a few minutes and I'll sort it out. Okay, Christy said, not too confidently. I hope you're right and everything will be okay. Until the evening, my sweet, I kiss and love you. Michael heard half of her conversation and smiled as he went back to his computer. That evening, Jake pulled into Mike's driveway. Christy opened the door and let him in, throwing her arms around his neck and kissing him passionately as he entered. Where is he? Jake asked when she pulled away from him. Christy pointed to the office door. He sat there all day, she said. Let me have a few words with him alone, said the lover, heading towards the office door. It does not take a lot of time. He knocked on the door, finding it locked. Mike, it's me, Jake, your friend. Can we talk for a few minutes? The door lock clicked and Jake stepped inside. He smiled friendly and wanted to move forward, extending his hand. But after taking a couple of steps, he stopped. The owner of the house sat at the table, leaning back in his chair, and looked intently at Jake, without even making an attempt to move. The smile faded from the guest's lips, and his hand, which had been hanging absurdly in the air, slowly dropped down. Close the door behind you and sit down, Michael commanded, pointing to an empty chair. Jake closed the heavy door and sat down, and Michael slowly poured himself a drink. Aren't you going to offer your friend a drink? Jake asked as the owner of the office screwed the cap on the bottle of scotch and placed it back on the counter. Michael looked straight at him for a moment, as if he were empty. Friend? Are you really my friend? Michael asked. Jake looked embarrassed, looking away. Damn, Christy was right. Now sitting in front of him was no longer the weak, pliable beta male he was used to dealing with. Of course, Jake said. I've been your best friend for many years, remember? Michael chuckled. Best friend, right? He drawled, as if tasting and rolling this simple phrase on his tongue. Tell me, my dear. Hmm. Best friend? What kind of friend is this who steals the wife of his old friend? A. Eh? Mike, I'm sorry that... Jake began before he was interrupted. You can't wait to get Christy, right? He asked. Jake nodded his head. How strong do you want her? In other words, how much do you think she's worth? What are you talking about? I don't know what you mean, Mike, Jake said, puzzled. Don't play dumb, Jake, Michael said with a grin. You are a very experienced business person, with a strong commercial acumen. Otherwise, you would not be able to earn all these millions of yours. You know that for any transaction, you always have to pay a certain price. So I'll repeat my question. How valuable is Christy to you? I... I don't know, Jake muttered, confused. It seems... You want to offer me something? I guessed it right, buddy, Michael confirmed with a wry grin. I really like your new Bentley. How much did you pay for this thing? I paid more than 500,000 bucks for it. It was made to special order, Jake answered with a poorly concealed tinge of boasting. As I understand it, the entire amount for the car has already been paid, right? Michael asked. Of course, he's all mine, Jake said. Well, that would be a good way to start our deal. Michael smiled and twirled the glass in his fingers, examining the shimmering liquid in the light. Your health. He saluted Jake, raising his glass and taking a sip. Wait, what? Jake drawled, as if he couldn't believe his ears. Do you want me to give up my Bentley? In exchange for Christy? Michael smiled thinly. Along with 25% of your net worth, he added casually. Jake's eyes suddenly became square. This... This is... More than $50 million, Jake exclaimed breathlessly. You must be joking or just crazy? 
according to my research, that's exactly $52,450, $389 plus 25 cents, Michael said, glancing briefly at his computer. And you're wrong. I'm serious. Absolutely serious. Jake jumped up from the offered chair and began nervously pacing around the office from corner to corner, muttering something under his breath and occasionally casting hostile glances at Michael. He sat calmly at his desk, absent-mindedly sorting through papers and did not seem to pay much attention to his friends' movements. Finally, he stopped his Brownian movement around the office and flopped back onto his chair, looking at Michael with tension. So you want my car and 25% of my net worth in exchange for Christie? Jake asked. Hmm, Christie was right. In front of him was not the same person whom he was used to so easily manipulating. Why do I even need to think about this? I already have your wife. Chuckling, Michael opened one of the documents on his computer and printed it out. Pulling out a sheet of paper from the printer that beeped briefly, he handed it to Jake. Yes, but what do you think will happen when your board of directors and your shareholders get this one day? Hmm. Do you think you will remain as rich and powerful when this scandalous document hits the media? I doubt it, Michael remarked, pouring himself another scotch. This is... blackmail? Jake croaked strainedly, having read the letter, which described in detail all the facts and details of their affair, as well as how he and Christie had mentally abused Mike for a long time and humiliated his dignity. Maybe... Think what you want, but my offer is only valid until noon tomorrow, said Michael. After 12 hours, it will increase to 50%, plus a controlling stake in your company. You want Christy? That's my price. Yes, this is highway robbery, Jake exclaimed angrily, throwing up his hands. I, you, you'll never get away with this. Maybe yes, maybe not, Michael said thoughtfully, sipping his drink. I know that you want her, although only God knows, he shrugged. Why you need her, but this is my price. And I'll tell you something else. If you accept my offer without any conditions, I will make sure that you two spend the rest of your lives together. I will disappear and never bother you again. Isn't this what you want? Well, yeah, I'd love to spend the rest of my life with Christy, Jake said. Michael smiled. Here you see, if you agree to this, I'll even promise to cook a festive dinner for you two, Michael offered. What do you say to this? Uh, uh. I need some time to think about everything, Jake replied. Michael nodded his head in understanding. I will give you until tomorrow noon. And don't forget, he added, defiantly arching his hand and tapping his fingernail on the dial of his wristwatch. Time has passed. The former friend took a handkerchief from his breast pocket and impulsively wiped it on his face and neck, sweating from excitement. Now, Please close the door behind you when you leave, Michael added, indicating that the meeting was over. I won't keep you any longer. Jake stood up in confusion and walked out of the office on stiff legs. The owner of the office watched through the curtains as Jake and Christy left the house. He smiled and made several calls. Christy returned home only early in the morning in her lover's car. Michael heard them talking in the driveway. Just think, Jake said. In just a couple of days, we can start our new life, free from Mike. Now, let me come inside and taste the taste of these breakfast muffins, he added, grabbing Christie's firm ass. She giggled and pulled his hand away. Not now, but soon enough, she promised. I can't wait to have Mike serving us as a waiter. Christie kissed him and watched Jake drive away. Then she entered the house and saw a light in her husband's study. I wonder if he was there all this time, she thought. She tried the door, but it was locked. Mike, she called through the door. I want... Go away, Michael's voice reached her. Christy stomped around the locked entrance a little more, listening, but then decided not to put any more pressure on him. She was more than concerned about her husband's strange behavior and went up to the master bedroom. The next morning, Michael received a short message from Jake. Agreed. He immediately responded with the offshore account number and a warning that he would monitor the transfer of funds to ensure the transaction was completed. A couple of hours later, 
Michael confirmed that the agreed amount was fully received, after which he instantly transferred it further, dividing it between several other accounts, to which he had exclusive access. After finishing his money matters, he sent messages to Jake and Christy. Dinner is today, at my expense. Be here exactly at 19 Gaub p.m. He went to get the ingredients he needed for dinner that night and returned an hour later, busy in the kitchen. Michael loved to cook, and there was something particularly sentimental and bittersweet about tonight's farewell dinner for him and his guests. Christy returned home around 6 Gashir p.m. that evening and went straight to the kitchen. She had never seen or had any idea until this evening that her husband could cook, but, apparently, he knew a lot about the kitchen. Whatever he was cooking smelled absolutely delicious. I didn't even know that you could cook, she said with genuine surprise. He looked at her with a raised eyebrow and leaned both hands on the table before speaking. You don't know much about me at all, he answered, wiping his palms with a rag. Maybe if you stayed at home from time to time, instead of running away to your lover, you would learn something too. At least I learned a lesson and learned how to stand up for myself. Now go and get yourself in order. Your gentleman will come soon. She again, like yesterday, tried to kiss him on the cheek, but he turned his head away and pulled away to avoid the touch. Christy backed out of the kitchen and then ran up the stairs, a tear running down her face. What have I done? She asked herself. A few minutes before seven, Jake appeared and pressed the bell at the entrance. Michael opened the door and let him inside. Without delaying matters, Jake at the threshold took out the signed documents from the folder he had brought with him and handed him a bunch of keys to the Bentley. Business comes first, right? Michael grinned. As I promised, Jake answered and coughed. Damn, my mouth is dry from all these events. Can I have something to drink? Thank you for keeping your promise. I'll treat you and Christy to some great champagne soon so you can really celebrate. Michael said, pocketing the keys. He was looking forward to driving the new Bentley. Christy soon made her way downstairs, radiant and looking absolutely stunning in a backless short black dress that left little to the imagination. Michael noticed that she had taken off her rings. She walked over to the dining table and Michael thoughtfully pulled out a chair for her. She smiled at him as she sat down, but he did not return her smile. Jake sat down too smiling wider than a Cheshire cat. You look beautiful, my dear, he told her, kissing her hand and looking at her with adoration. And I see that you have finally taken off your rings. This is very good. She smiled again as Michael brought two glasses of champagne and placed them on the table in front of them. He returned to the kitchen and returned a minute later, carrying a large dish in his hands. When he removed the lid, a cloud of steam escaped, and they all enjoyed the aroma of Michael's lasagna. Smells divine, Mike, Jake admitted, straightening the napkin on his lap. Perhaps you have missed your true calling. Michael said nothing, as he served two portions, one on each plate. Christy took the instruments in her hands, but stopped, raising her gaze to him. Aren't you going to join us? she asked. Michael shook his head, pouring champagne into tall glasses. No, he answered. This festive dinner is intended only for the two of you. I don't want to stop you from enjoying your food and each other. Michael stepped aside and watched for a while as the lovers sipped champagne, toasting each other and their happy future together. Soon they stopped paying attention to him and did not even notice how he retreated to his office with a wry smile on his face. Sinking into a chair, he looked at his watch. Any moment now, Michael thought, and indeed very soon he heard two dull blows and the rattling of a fallen fork. Walking out of the office and looking into the dining room, he saw Christy and Jake slouched in their chairs. Jake's pale face crushed a plate of half-eaten lasagna, and his left arm hung almost to the floor. Christy's body with her dress riding up on her hips slid a little from the chair, seductively exposing the strings of her stockings, her head bowed to her chest, and on the floor, under her hand, leaning back on the arm of the chair, fragments from a broken glass scattered. Okay, he thought. 
They'll be out for at least six hours. Michael changed his clothes and got to work, stripping both lovers naked, intertwining their bodies and tying their arms and legs around each other. Grabbing a wheeled cart from the garage, he took the two outside, after wrapping their unconscious bodies in heavy chains, to which weights were attached for security. Michael placed ball gags in their mouths in case they woke up before he reached his destination. It wasn't easy, but he still managed to fit them both into a large canvas bag that he had bought especially for this occasion. Using a dolly and a portable lift, Michael transferred the bag of lovers into the trunk of the Bentley, then closed and locked the lid. Under the numerous stars pouring out in the quickly darkening sky, he got into the car and headed out of the city. Reaching his destination a few hours later, he heard scuffling and muffled grunting before he loosened and pulled back the neck of the moving bag. Two completely stunned heads poked out from there, looking around in complete panic in the darkness that thickened around them. Michael leaned over them, carrying a small pocket stun gun. If you promise to remain silent, I will remove the gags and answer any questions you may have, he said. But if you scream, I guarantee you won't like my reprimand, he added, showing off the stun gun in his hand. They nodded their heads almost in unison, and Michael released them from their gags. Where are we? Christy asked in horror. Who are you? What is going on? There were clearly panicked notes in her breaking voice. Yes, Jake said. What the hell is going on here? According to my GPS, we are at the very place where your husband committed suicide, Michael said to his unfaithful wife. What? Mike, did you commit suicide? Christy screamed, her eyes widening. Like this? What are you talking about? Yes, he told me all about how you mean to him the last couple of years, depriving him of sex, cuckolding him, humiliating him, and much more, Michael said. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about good manners. You probably think I'm Mike. Actually, I'm his twin brother, Michael. He and I not only share DNA, but we also happen to have the same name and the same middle initial. Jake and Christy stared at him in shock, like a pair of deer caught in the headlights on the road. I warned him about you, Christy, but he lost his head with love and didn't want to listen to me. You have no idea. How close I was, Michael brought his thumb and forefinger almost together. To intervene and say something at that moment when the preacher said, If anyone has a reason why these two should not marry, let him say so now. But then, I didn't do anything, and I still blame myself for it, he added bitterly. Did you, were you at our wedding? Christy asked in amazement. I don't remember seeing you. I was dressed so as not to attract too much attention to myself, said Michael. You see, Christy, although outwardly Mike and I have a lot in common, in reality, we are completely different. He was a patient and kind-hearted man who always got along with everyone around him. Unlike me, he avoided conflicts in every possible way. And most importantly, he loved you with all his heart, and was willing to put up with almost anything just to make you happy. I, on the other hand, oh, I saw right through you from the very beginning. I was sure that you were an insidious bitch who would cheat on him at the first convenient and profitable opportunity for you. How did I know this? Well, you can call it intuition, sixth sense, or insight. It doesn't matter. For Mike's sake, I just hoped I was wrong about you, but unfortunately for him, I was right, he added dejectedly, clasping his fingers tightly and looking off into the distance. Mike never said anything about having a brother, Christy muttered in shock. Yes, because I urgently asked him about it, Michael said. You see, officially I don't exist. I would tell you why, but then I would have to kill you. Although, wait a minute. He threw back his head and laughed. As you can see, it's dark enough now that you probably won't recognize your surroundings, Michael continued after he finished laughing at his own joke. If you're still wondering, we're in the deepest part of the bottomless lake, the very place where Mike ended all that crap a few days ago. You see, Christy, he couldn't take what you did to him anymore, and he took the easiest and fastest way out. I tried to stop him, but he was inconsolable. Tears streamed down Christy's face. Mike, did he commit suicide? 
she asked in a trembling voice. I, my God, I never wanted him to die. Bullshit, lying bitch, Michael snorted contemptuously. You yourself threw it in his face that you didn't love him. You might as well put a gun to his head and pull the trigger. Michael looked at Jake. As for you, asshole, you've been pretending to be his best friend all these years, and you still haven't answered my question. What kind of friend is this who steals his friend's wife? Why are you keeping silent? Do you lower your head? Maybe you finally feel ashamed? Michael asked with open sarcasm. The truth is, you little bastard was never his friend. You used him to get what you wanted. You loved playing on his feelings, cuckolding him, and humiliating him every chance you got. But you promised me that Christy and I would spend the rest of our lives together, remember? Jake asked hoarsely. He raised his head and practically growled, glaring at his captor with anger. You lied to me. You fooled me. Michael just laughed. You're right. I told you that you two would spend the rest of your lives together. And I didn't lie about that, Michael said. I just didn't say that your lifespan will suddenly be shortened sharply. So, yes, your future life together will be stormy, but very short. You will even die together on the same day, as in all these romantic stories. Michael grinned. And it will be well-deserved, damn it, since you two conspired against my brother. Please don't do this to me, to us, Christy begged, sobbing, tears rolling down her cheeks. Mikhail looked at her coldly and gloomily. Mike told me that he begged you with the same words before you humiliated him and cuckolded him with your lover. He was just crushed when he told me about it, Michael said. But then you just laughed in his face and told him to come to terms with the role of the cuckold that you had prepared for him. Well, bitch, now it's your turn to accept the inevitable. You're just a crazy psycho, she squealed and twitched inside the bag. Release us immediately. You won't get away with this. Michael shrugged. Maybe not. Maybe yes, he said. But once your goodbye message is found on your computer, it won't matter anymore. Although, he chuckled, I must admit that this is a very, very touching and heartwarming letter. But let's change the subject. You probably know that no one has ever found the bottom of this lake. It's not for nothing that they call him bottomless. And there's enough weight on that chain wrapped tightly around the two of you to make sure your descent is swift. Michael reached out and tugged at the jingling links of the chain. Both accomplices, as if paralyzed, stared at him with round eyes in horror. Both were trembling violently. I estimate that you two will last no more than 60 seconds before losing consciousness. You may even live a few more minutes after this. Well, it's time to say goodbye. Michael sighed with a wry smile. It's a pity that this time we have to do without a priest, rings, solemn music, and an official ceremony. Well, anyway, I hope you still like your honeymoon. Enjoy. Michael completely untied the bag and, straining with all his strength, turned it over until the pair of lovers, twitching desperately, struggling with each other and screaming in horror, splashed into the water. Bon voyage, he said quietly at the end, watching as the silvery cocoon of chains, palely dimming, disappeared into the inky depths, and many bubbles floated to the surface. Soon, the bubbles stopped appearing, and silence reigned again over the dark surface of the lake, cut only by a glittering path of moonlight. Michael started the quietly rattling boat engine and headed back to the bay pier, guided by the pier lights breaking through the early morning fog. There he moored the boat, turned off the engine and jumped into the Bentley, parked secluded in the thick shadow of the docks. Turning the key in the ignition, accompanied by the soft purr of the revived engine, he made a mental note. Burn the bag to destroy all traces of its previous contents. He then took his phone out of his inner pocket and sent a short text message. It is done. The answer came almost instantly. Thank you, brother. Enjoy the ride. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.